FKC 12410, Phone Recovery Services, LLC v. Horizon of New England, Inc. and others. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Rich, and I represent uh, Phone Recovery Services. Uh, this morning, the issue presented to the court is whether uh, the 911 charge uh, is a tax or a fee. Uh, at the outset, I would note a couple things. While not outcome determinative, it is, does bear noting at the outset that the statute at issue here, Chapter 6A, Section 18H, little a, identifies this charge as a surcharge. The statute also uh, charges enforcement of uh, failure to pay these two the Attorney General's Office and not the Department of Revenue. And in fact, uh, Your Honors, the very bills that are generated and sent to customers refer on the bill as a fee and not a tax. And that's Record Appendix, page 285. We have an example of one of the bills. It's not, of course, outcome determinative, but I do think it helps set the, the foundation for the Emerson analysis that follows. Um, Again, uh, it's very clear that the, that the framework the court is to follow here is that established by Emerson College and its progeny for the last 30, 32, 33 years. I would note at the outset that uh, there are three factors, but they are just that. They're factors. They're not elements. And in fact, Judge Cowan, writing for the, the court in the Silva case, talked about the second factor as being is to be given less weight. So talking about weighing of factors. There are two appeals court decisions, the Greater Franklin case that talks about the second factor not being determinative, and the Morton case from the appeals court talking about one particular factor being only subsidiary to um, the other factors. So again, it's a balancing test. It's a weighing of how these factors uh, fit together. With regard to the um, first factor. Maybe before you get there. Sure. Uh... Most, maybe all of these cases uh, regarding fees versus tax come in the context of whether or not a city or town has the power to levy it uh, because Article 2, Section 7 says a city or town does not have the power to levy, assess, and collect taxes. Uh, if you are right, could Boston, could Worcester, assess its own 911 fee? It's not something, Your Honor, that I've given a lot of thought to. Um, but I think if, I, I think the answer to that question would be no. And the reason for that is because it would fail the Emerson College test. And, it, and if you, again, let's focus on the first factor of the Emerson College test, which is charge for an exchange, in exchange for a particular government service which benefits the party paying the fee in a manner not shared by members of society. If you look at uh, Judge Ireland's decision in the Denver Street LLC case, that uh, really was a crystallization of what that factor is and what that factor is designed to do. The court there held that inquiry does not involve an exact measuring or quantifying of comparative economic benefits. Instead, the inquiry is whether a limited group is receiving a benefit that is, in fact, spe sufficiently specific and special to its members. So what's, what's the specific benefit here? Okay, I know you're trying to get back on track there okay. uh, <laughs> with your argument, but it still seems that if you are right, if it is not a tax, nothing would bar a city or town from imposing it. I, I think that that's right. It, it, it would be a fee. It would be a fee. So basically, Boston could levy its own 911 fee, and Worcester could, and Fall River could. Uh, and again, I, I don't mean to not answer your question directly, but it would it would it would require an analysis of the three factors. So it would. So but, let me but, give you. But I guess that's my point. Or I'm supposed to be asking questions, but I still make <laughs> points. Uh, it has to be. Can it be a tax for purposes? I mean. If it's a tax, is it a tax for all purposes? Uh, yeah, your, your Honor, 
again, it would depend. What is the city of Boston doing with the money that's being collected associated with this charge? Is it, is it being used for the general fund? Is it going, that would, that would augur in favor of it being a tax. If it's being put into a specialized uh, account and used in some purpose to cover the expenses. Now, I'm not sure how they could do that because there is a, a, a statutory framework with regard to how this money is, comes in and how it's used, but if you're focusing on the third factor. So I, I, I think it would depend on really what the legislation, how, how, it, how it enacted it, but I think it is at least conceivable that it could be a fee. So the, 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 are you saying that the definition of tax for purposes of the relator provisions could be different from the in, a definition of a tax for purposes of Article 2, Section 7? Again, it's not something that I've given a, a lot of thought to, but I think that the tax bar um, is, is a tax bar which um, pertains to uh, barring a, a, a relator from bringing a false claims case. So um, back to sort of the, the first factor, um, what, and, and what is the special benefit that is inuring to the individuals who pay this fee? And here, what we're really talking about is access. Access to this 911 service, immediate access. Some might even call it preferential access. There's no question that others, others generally have the ability to receive a benefit of having someone else call 911 for them. So if, if I use the chief's cell phone and call 911, I've got the benefit of the service, right? You, you, do, you do have a benefit, and the, and the analysis that particularly in Denver Street we're, we're talking about isn't, isn't, is the public at large getting any benefit, but is there some specialized benefit that the person paying the fee gets? So in your example, Justice Gaziano, you would have to get Chief Justice Gant's telephone. There would have to be a bystander in the right place at the right time to dial the number. Having the phone, having the access, this is quite frankly why people have home phones in a lot of respects still, is having the ability to have immediate unrestricted access to this particular service without having to be in a position of fortuitously having Chief Justice Gantz next to you with a telephone who can dial the number for you or, 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 or not. But isn't it the case that normally the person who needs the 911 access is the person who is not going to be in a position to? So you usually hear somebody call 911? There is no question, Judge. but but. I will say two things about that. First, I think, let's remember that we're at the 12B6 stage. That's where this case was dismissed. And I think what you're talking about is a evidentiary analysis about who is receiving and how is receiving and who has phones and whatnot. But, but so, let me answer your question. So a judge can't say it's common knowledge that if I see my neighbor's house on fire, and I call 911. Uh, of course, of course you can. Right. But to the extent that, and we that, need, that we need we need we need uh, a record for that. No, but I I do think if you are if you are analyzing this factor in the sense of uh, looking to where what percentage of people are getting a benefit themselves, this and, and again it's immediate access. In in Justice Bud's question, there has to be someone who's fortuitously in the right place at the right time, and it happens but very isn't it, often. isn't it true that um, all, the, all cell phones have 911 service, even if it's not specifically paid for or uh, not specifically uh, uh, it, collected? My, my understanding is that that is true. But again, I, I, on that particular example, and, and there's also the pay phone example, right. I really do think that there has to be some evidentiary foundation, because I, I, I would have to say, talking about common experience and knowledge, the number of people who don't have cell phone service and are walking around with cell phones for the ability to call 911, I would have to imagine that that percentage is some infinitesimal amount relative to those that are. And again, now, now what about where, if they do collect any of the money, where it goes? What, how, how much does that factor into anything? Does it go into a special fund? Would it go into specific services? Yeah. So, so there, you're. I think you're talking about the third factor, okay. which, which, right. it, 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 what, six uh, a eighteen h, talks specifically about the money that is comes into the nine one one associated with this are for expenses associated with services. And 18H subsection D talks about how the money is remitted and where it goes and what it uses. And there, um, the analysis really is, 
what is the money going to be used for? Mm -hmm. And if the money is reasonably designed to compensate the, the, the provider of the service, it's a fee. And if it's going to something else, it's not a fee. And so here, uh, it's quite clear. And if, if you look at the, the Murphy case involving the toll road, if you look at the Silva case from this court, again, the Denver Street case, the Bertone case, all of those cases very specifically talk very analogously to, to this particular situation where the money is designed particularly not to fund energy efficient projects, which was the Shea case, or not designed for, in the Emerson case, for fire safety generally. The money that's coming in is being used to operate, run, enhance, and make up this integrated 911 system. So I think um, on, on, on that particular factor, the, the, the statutory language is very helpful. Similarly, the CMR, 220 CMR 1603 subsection 1, is quite helpful in talking about, it says the surcharge is intended to, and this is in our brief, by the way, intended to recover prudently incurred cost associated with the provision of the 911 service. So there's you, a, a, you, you agree that we weigh factors, and that was your opening. We weigh factors, and if one, and one fact is not determinative. Correct. Correct. And, and in fact, I think that where the court, where this court has really drilled in is on the second factor, saying that factor is really um, with regard to proprietary fees, it's given no weight. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the Silva court, this court noted in Silva that other jurisdictions have abandoned the voluntariness aspect altogether. Um, and there, I, I, if I were to refer you to a case on this second factor, um, Justice Graney's decision in the nuclear metals case, and to a le lesser extent in um, the Bertone case, speaks to sort of the conundrum as to what is voluntariness and how do you, how do you sort of suss that out. And, and Justice Graney held, we recognize that the choice presented in these cases isn't really a free choice. And so, uh, that, and I think that, <laughs> bumps up against really why it's, it's so challenging. You know, it's, it's our position that you don't need a telephone. Um, it, 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 is a, it is a voluntary choice. It is different than in Shea where, Shea versus Boston Edison, where the enabling legislation explicitly talked about the fact that, um, that electric service was a commodity, et cetera, et cetera, um, essential to the health and well-being of all residents. The language of the statute in Shea said it was a, quote, mandatory charge. That's what the enabling legislation spoke to. Um, and there again, I come back to uh, if the court does find the second factor a compelling consideration relative to um, these other factors, I, I do think that an evidentiary foundation is, is required to, to ascertain what, what, is, what is voluntariness in this context means. I, I, I really do think it, it ought to be um, given very little weight at all, but to the extent the court um, does consider that material to its consideration, I, I would um, suggest that th that that is the case. If I can, if I can turn you to some other factors. Uh, original source. Yes. Uh, key tam generally is meant that somebody has some inside information with regard to a fraud and is going to say, I, a whistleblower, know this, and I'm going to furnish this information to the government so that they can protect the government from fraud. Uh, your corporation, or LLC, I forget, uh, don't know that you have any particular inside information. Why do you get past the original source requirement that it not be something which for which there has been publicity, which was not, say, publicly di disclosed. Well, so, so I think we can break that down in, in several elements. And there was a long discussion in the transcript below about that. And I, I, I would push back a little bit on in, in, insider is not a requirement of these kinds of statutes. But um, what you're referring to are very fact-specific analyses and um, ones that are, are not amenable to 12b6. And they're certainly not amenable to um, a, a situation where we have an amended complaint, which is in the record, which I, the court below, and we've cited the transcript, talked about if it, it was really focused on the tax bar and then the individual versus person, which the court thought were, were capable of being dealt with um, 
on a, on a on a 12b6 or at least with you know without giving us a shot to articulate okay. in the context let's assume of let's assume that we say that it must be individual and you decide to amend by putting that individual how is that individual going to be able to demonstrate that he has information which was not publicly disclosed well it be, it, well the answer is is that if you read the amended complaint you will see the entire and I see I'm running out of time the the entire story of how mr. Schneider came to came upon all of this and learned all this and put all of these disparate pieces together and 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 determined what was really happening with here. all the litigation in the other states no there was not as a result of litigation if you read the amended complaint which well, there's been litigation in other states right correct but but the the issue of um, the original source and uh, that factor, all of the facts upon which that determination is made are pre-suit one, whenever that first suit was filed, as it relates to, to my client. And there is no case. Their argument is um, much about newspaper articles that were published talking about problems in the industry generally, nothing in Massachusetts, nothing involving the types of issues we're talking about. And if you read our brief, you can see we, we make very specific reference to a case, federal court, I think it's a Seventh Circuit case that talks about that's not enough to have something at, at publicly disclosed in advance. Thank right. you very much. I appreciate the time this morning. Thank you. Mr. Skidmore. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Greg Skidmore, I represent Verizon and XO, and I'll be speaking on behalf of all the defendants' appellees today. Your Honors, the 911 charge has all of the hallmarks of attacks. It is imposed by the legislature on a broad segment of society. It is mandatory. One cannot opt out of the charge if one does not want 911 emergency services. And it goes to fund a benefit for the general public the 911 emergency services system. That is all of the hallmarks of attacks. So what, what do you think when you compare this, this situation to Shea, to Silva, to the other cases, what would you say is the distinguishing factor between this and those fee cases? Uh, so Shea is a tax case? No, it's all a balancing test, and no one factor has any particular weight. But what, what in, just in terms of distinguishing cases, what, what makes this one different? So a couple points, Your Honor. One is, is that in Shea, this court held that the charge there was a tax, and this, this case is just like Shea. Okay. So in Shea, it was imposed on all users of electricity. Here, the charge is imposed on all users of telephones. In Shea, it funded a service for the general public renewable energy programs. Here, the 911 charge funds a service for the general public, 911 emergency services. In Shea, the charge was mandatory. You could not opt out of it, even if you didn't like renewable energy sources. Here, you cannot opt out of the 911 charge, even if you never want to call 911, even if you hate the concept of 911. So the difference between this case and the cases in which the court has found a fee goes to the very heart of the distinction between the tax and the fee. In the fee cases, if you wanted to get the particularized service, you had to pay the charge. If you didn't want that particularized service, then you didn't have to pay the charge. If you wanted to bury a body in Silva, you had to pay the fee. And in exchange, you got a piece of paper that says, you get to bury the body. If you want to dispose of nuclear and, and waste. And how is that not mandatory? Well. A few points, Your Honor. So that's a regulatory fee case, and there was a lot of discussion about the second factor, the voluntariness factor. What this court has said is that in a regulatory fee case, the voluntariness factor is less important or perhaps should not be considered. Okay, so what makes the uh, 911 not a regulatory fee? Uh, There's no argument in this case that it's a regulatory um, fee, Your Honor. Okay. The, what what it, PRS is arguing been? is that it's a user fee. So a user fee is a fee that you pay in exchange for getting to use a government service or government property. So that's the toll road case, that's the Murphy case. And the Murphy case shows why this case is different. If I wanna drive on the toll road, I have to pay the, the toll. And if I don't wanna pay the toll, I can avoid the toll road. I can take another highway, I can take the T. But what you can't do, sorry, for the 911 charge, you can't avoid it. There's no way to avoid it. You have to pay it even if you never use the 911 service at all. Now, there's been a lot of discussion well, here. Well, there is a way to avoid it. You just don't have a telephone. Well, Your Honor, but this court addressed that in Shea, and it said that that is not the case. What is not the case is whether you can avoid 
um, the, you know, having electricity or using a telephone. It's, it's whether you can avoid the government service. 911 is available to everyone. Whether or not you pay a 911 charge, and anyone can use it. Let me give a couple of examples of that. So uh, imagine there's a mad gunman that runs into a homeless shelter. Uh, someone outside calls 911, and because they call 911, the police are alerted quickly and can come to the rescue. Everyone inside that homeless shelter has benefited from the 911 system, even though presumably many, if not all of them, have not paid the 911 charge. The same would be true if there was a fire in an elementary school and the fire department came quickly. Everyone has benefited even though no one there has paid the 911 charge. And that's really the key point here, Your Honor. There's been a lot of discussion this morning about direct and immediate access to the 911 system. That is not the service that the 911 charge funds. You can look through the entire lengthy statute, it's a long one, and you will see no reference to providing direct and immediate service to a small subset of the population that pays the charge. Instead, the statute is very clear what it funds. The 911 charge funds the state 911 department, which is charged for putting together a 911 emergency system for the entire Commonwealth. That is what the 911 charge funds. It is for the general public, and it is not something that you can avoid or not pay. And this is another critical point, Your Honor, is that you have access to the 911 service even if you've never paid a 911 charge. So for example, Justice Gaziano gave the example of borrowing someone's cell phone, even if you've never paid it. But there's the other, even other examples. I don't live in Massachusetts. So I've never paid a 911 charge to the state of Massachusetts. But if I pull the, the phone out of my pocket right now and I dial 911, I have the same direct, immediate access to the 911 system as everyone who has paid the charge. The same is true of someone who has never paid a 911 charge to any state. We talked already this morning about the federal law that says that every working phone, even if it doesn't have a, a service plan, has to be able to access 911. It's federal law. And, uh, and we talked about pay phones, uh, and we talked about other things like that. So, it's not about direct and immediate access. What it's about is what the 911 charge funds is the emergency services uh, system. And, and think about it, this is not, this is not a pay for play type situation. When you dial 911, they don't answer the phone and say, okay, please provide proof that you've paid the 911 charge, and if so, you may proceed, and if not, you have to hang up and dial your local precinct. That's not how it works. Everyone has access to the 911 system, just like everyone has access to the public roads, even though not everybody pays the auto excise tax. But if you want to drive on a toll road, you have to pay the toll, and that's the difference. This case is like the auto excise taxes. It's not like the toll roads. There was also mention this morning about, uh, it's called a surcharge in the statute. That's absolutely right. And as we say in our brief, and as the court said below, a surcharge is defined in, in Black's Law Dictionary as a tax, charge, or cost. And more importantly, this court has said over and over and over again that the labels don't matter. The charge was called a fee in the Emerson case, and it was still held to have the attributes of a tax. And it certainly doesn't matter what the providers call it on the bills. If it doesn't have any legal significance what the legislature calls it, it certainly doesn't have any legal significance of what a private party calls it on the bills. If that were the case, then a private party could change Massachusetts law just by putting a different label on a particular charge, and that's certainly not how the law works. So under the three Emerson factors, this is clearly a tax. It goes to fund a public service, the emergency 911 service, and there's no, uh, you don't get anything extra if you pay the 911 charge. You have the same access as everyone else. Two, it's mandatory. You cannot opt out of the 911 charge if you don't want access to the 911 services. You have to pay it no matter what. And three, is it goes to fund uh, you know, general services that uh, benefit everyone. So importantly, the third factor, you know, we don't need the third factor to win. Emerson makes clear that if, if it's clearly a tax under the first two factors, you don't even have to look at the third factor. But the trial court got it exactly right. 
The 911 charges fund a broad array of services. This is clear in the statute, section 18H, subsection D as in dog, subsection 18B, and uh, chapter 166, so section 15E. It, it funds all kinds of services relating to the 911 department, training, uh, the 911 telecom services. It also funds things that don't relate to 911. It funds uh, the ability for disabled individuals to get telecommunications equipment so that they can make any phone call, not just a 911 call. So it funds a broad array of services. And it's not intended to compensate the government for the expenses it incurs. Massachusetts could have a system if it wanted where if you called 911, you got a bill. And the bill was you know, a fee of whatever amount for in, in compensation for the expenses incurred in, in dealing with that 911 call. But that's not the system that, that we have. And there's probably very good public policy reasons for that. Instead, what we have is a system where there is a tax assessed on a broad segment of the population, whether or not that population ever uses the service, and it goes to fund a service for the benefit of the general public. Another point, Your Honor, no discovery is needed in this case. Um, as Your Honor pointed out, you can certainly use common knowledge. You can certainly reference uh, both the very plain language of the statutes at issue here and the plain language of the federal laws that have been referenced. There are no facts necessary. Everything is laid out in the statute. How the 911 charge works, what it funds, uh, the fact that it's mandatory, it's all laid out in the statute. There's no discovery here that's necessary at all. The tax bar is a question of law. It can and should be decided on a motion to dismiss. Now, if you do not win on the tax point, do you not prevail on the motion to dismiss because of the amended complaint? No, Your Honor, because we also prevail on the public disclosure bar. Uh, and again, the public, uh, the, the public disclosure bar also cannot be cured by an amendment. And so a few points on that. So one is that courts in Washington, D.C., Iowa, and Illinois have reviewed substantially similar complaints to the ones here filed by uh, sisters or cousins of phone recovery services that make the same allegations and those courts have all dismissed, on a motion to dismiss, those complaints on the public dis disclosure bar grounds. And those cases are attached to the addendum to our brief. With the same language that we have in our statute or different language? It is substantially the same, Your Honor. And, and the courts have all said, uh, relying on the same news articles that we uh, rely on here and that are attached in the record, um, starting at page record 64, they relied on the same news articles and found that the case was barred based on public disclosure. And that makes sense because the allegations here have been publicly disclosed. The allegation is that the telecom companies are not collecting and remitting the right amount of 911 charges. But that is exactly what all the articles have said going back to 2010 and 2011. There's a 2010 article at the record, page 77, and it's all about whether or not a telecom company had collected the right amount on a multi-line telephone service. There's a series of articles at record 67, 70, and 72, all discussing allegations that telephone companies are not collecting all the 911 charges they should be. The court can and should take judicial notice of these articles. That's the Haggerty case, 95, F sub 3rd at 256, which is a federal court case in Massachusetts from 2015 that was affirmed by the First Circuit. And I heard PRS argue before that, well, those articles don't count because they don't mention anything about Massachusetts. Well, that's not the law. The law is the articles don't have to be so laser focused like that. And if you look at the Winkleman case, which we cite in our brief, it's a district of Massachusetts case that again was affirmed recently by the First Circuit. And in that case, the public disclosure bar was held to apply. None of the news sources, none of the other sources referred to Massachusetts. Instead, they referred to things like a Connecticut Attorney General report, and news articles about Connecticut and Rhode Island and a labor union study. The key question, and this is in our brief, is whether the articles, quote, are sufficient to set the government on the trail of the alleged fraud. That's from the natural gas royalties case from the Tenth Circuit. So clearly the allegations here have been publicly disclosed, 
As Your Honor pointed out, PRS is not an original source. They have no insider information. They are a created for litigation corporation um, that, that is not a true whistleblower. The False Claims Act is all about whistleblowers, true insiders who have inside information and bring that to the attention of the government because the government would not otherwise be aware of the, the alleged fraud. That is not the situation here. When you take what's available in, in public news sources and you just repackage it in a complaint, you're not adding anything. You're not doing what a relator is supposed to do. And that is exactly what the public disclosure bar is for. And so the court can affirm on either ground. It's certainly, the 911 charge certainly is a tax under the Emerson test. And the allegations in this complaint have been publicly disclosed uh, and, and can be dismissed there. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked your brother, which is if we were to find that it was a fee, does that mean that local governments could assess it? Uh, Your Honor, if, if it were said to be a fee, then yeah, I think probably local governments could assess it. And there would be a lot of other, um, uh, so I think the answer is to, to the question is yes. And so then you would have a situation where all kinds of municipalities could potentially be uh, assessing additional 911 charges. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Your Honors.